My name's Rob. Uh, for the past six years, I've worked with an organization known as CALT, and we are experts at helping organizations improve their internal and external audience engagement. In 2012, my colleagues and I at CALT set out to see if we could learn the secrets of the world's most coveted brands. And um, what we uncovered is what I call the black art of cult branding. And you can read about it in my book or watch my TED talk for that. But through the course of the study, what we uncovered were six principles that cult brands apply that other brands just don't. And I think the good news story behind all of this is that any brand or any organization can learn and apply these same principles to achieve the same outcome. The only thing that's standing in your way is really your organization's or your company's culture and its courage. Does your culture one that uh, embraces change or does change provoke feelings of fear and uncertainty? Um, is your leadership possess the courage to abandon short-term thinking and make longer-term investments. An organization's competency has far less bearing on its ability to achieve cult status than its culture and its courage. Um, today, I just want to focus on one of those principles, though, how cult brands inspire advocacy from within. Uh, but before we do, um, a a question for you. How many people in the audience here have a smartphone with them? Raise your hands. Okay, now keep your hands raised if the brand of smartphone that you have is a Nokia brand smartphone. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> and it's interesting because in 2008, Nokia had 50% of the global smartphone market. Yet just a few years later, they had just a fraction so why is it that nobody owns a Nokia smartphone anymore? If you were to ask their former CEO, he would say it was our culture that sunk our company. It was a time in Nokia's history where uh, employees were stealing resources from other departments and departments were lying about their performance. They had a corporate culture that overemphasized their engineering prowess over their user experience design um, capabilities, and bureaucracy had really killed their agility and uh, prevented them from adapting to competitive threats like by uh, market entrants such as Apple. Um, so what Nokia failed to realize is something I think a lot of companies fail to realize, unfortunately, and that is that culture is often, over anything else, a company's greatest asset. Um, and this leads me to the principle that I want to focus on today. Contrary to popular belief, cult followings don't spontaneously materialize amongst a group of external consumers. Um, cult brands succeed at igniting advocacy and igniting um, cult followings from within, not from external sources. And they do this by focusing on being inspiring to their internal audience first. They focus their engagement efforts as much on their internal audience of employees as they do on external customers. And it's been proven to pay off. In fact, the correlation between uh, employee engagement and profitability is so strong, Parnassus created an investment fund for it. And that investment fund was based on the companies that are consistently voted the top places to work. And that fund went on to become one of the best performing funds in the entire world. Um, I feel like I'm preaching a little to the choir here in this case. Um, so if you believe, as Parnassus did, um, that the correlation between a highly engaged workforce and business success exists, then where should your company uh, be making its investments? These are the three areas that cult brands invest in consistently. Um, this is the secret sauce slide. Um, so if you would like a better version of it than that's printed in your guide, you can, uh, I can email the PDF out. Um, but I've worked with some of the world's most successful brands, and I can tell you that these are the kinds of things that they spend money on that their mediocre peers do not. And notice that none of them says advertising. <laughs> um, this is really uh, gold, so please steal the ideas from this slide. Um, I want to share a few examples of how cult brands make investments in these areas. 
Um, SodaStream, who owns a SodaStream sparkling water maker? Yeah, they're wildly popular, yet this is a company that spends relatively little on its advertising. In fact, I've never even seen an ad for a SodaStream sparkling uh, water machine. But how many people have seen their recruitment videos? Millions of people have tuned into YouTube and watched SodaStream's uh, recruitment videos. Instead of spending millions of dollars on expensive advertising to convince consumers to buy their products, they invest in their employer brand instead and do things like making viral videos starring their CEO as a way of exposing their cheeky brand personality and their brand culture so that they can attract job candidates that share their brand values. Does anyone remember 10 years ago when Starbucks just about went bankrupt? Yeah, you probably don't because the brand turned around and that turnaround is credited to the cultural recalibration that happened. In 2008, Howard Schultz returned as CEO and he immediately closed 7,100 stores and he did that so he could retrain and indoctrinate all store staff in the Starbucks way. And I think they actually just did the same thing a few weeks back to teach store staff more cultural sensitivity. He's also done things like invest $35 million into what they call the Starbucks Leadership Lab. And this is an internal experiential marketing program that's designed to transform 10,000 store managers into evangelical ambassadors for the brand. And Zappos. Zappos is a company I've spent countless hours within the four walls of their headquarters in Las Vegas. And they're a brand and a company that has really nailed employee engagement. They have numerous employee rewards and recognition programs in place, and no one ever wants to leave Zappos. In fact, thousands of people apply every single year for just a handful of jobs at Zappos. Um, their culture is so effective that their parent company, Amazon, won't mess with their culture. And they've even turned their culture into a new revenue stream for the company. Any company can now go down and learn and pay, by paying Zappos to attend their culture camp so they can learn and apply the same principles in their own business. What some of these brands recognize, like Zappos and SodaStream and Starbucks, is that culture isn't just mere decoration, right? Ping pong tables are often a sign, I've found, of a failed employee engagement strategy. And these strategies fail because leadership fails to identify and address the root causes of disengaged workforce. And so they, instead they focus on trying to address the lack of things like fun. Um, what I found most surprising was that cult brands prioritize marketing investments last, right? Because to cult brands, people are a business first priority. And this is counterintuitive, right? It's like that moment in the airline safety video where they say to put your, your air mask on before you put it on your child. Um, so not many businesses focus on this, but when you invest in people and culture and then wrap that in a compelling ethos, it can be so very powerful. It reminds me of the story in 1962 when John F. Kennedy was visiting the NASA Space Center. He came across a janitor who was pushing a broom along. He went up to him and he said, and he introduced himself and he asked, uh, what is it you're doing? What's your job here? And the janitor put his broom up and said, well, I'm helping put a man on the moon. That's the power. Um, but it really all begs the question, who's responsible, right? Whose job is it? I think this is where most organizations really fail. They fail to assign ownership of culture at the very top. Um, who is it in your C-suite that's accountable for culture? Um, but whose job really is it to perpetuate and cultivate culture on a long-term basis? Most of the companies that I work with are faced with this problem. The traditional HR role is very important, but highly administrative in its function. Cult brands succeed at fusing HR and marketing for culture building. And it makes a lot of sense because marketing is, has some advantages over HR in a couple of um, ways when it comes to culture building. One, marketing really gets engagement <clears throat> because engagement is known to drive profitability and that's something that marketers should or hopefully are tasked with. Two, culture building requires, requires a constant and persuasive approach to communications, not dissimilar to the kind of external communications that many marketers are fixated with, and I say fixated because I think that this is the real problem at hand. 
Marketers are addicted to expensive advertising as a method of acquiring customers, and that chews up a lot of resources. So I think we have a long way to go here. Um, it's true that companies have spent more and more money, $4.5 billion on employee engagement, but that pales in, to, in comparison to the $200 billion that marketers have spent on advertising in the year 2016 alone. So can I finish with some takeaways? Yeah. One takeaway? <laughs> All right. Um, cult brands, um, here's what cult brands do. One, they invest in culture first, those three areas that I shared with you. Two, they make culture accountable within the C-suite. Three, they deploy marketing resources as a way to dial up internal engagement. And four, they really treat their employees as they would their best customers by making concerted efforts to engender true brand attachment and inspire advocacy from within. Thank you. Thank you.